I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Mark Kao, the president of FAPA, to give the opening remarks. Mark. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome you all to this uh, important event. And uh, it's great to see all the old and the new friends in Washington, D.C. Taiwan appears to be drifting toward China. And uh, as a Taiwanese-American organization, we are very concerned about the drifting toward China. And we hope we can do something to strengthen the Taiwan's democracy and human rights. And uh, this was something that Taiwanese has worked really hard in the last 30 years to achieve, and we need to preserve it. The Sunflower Movement in Taiwan shows that there is a new generation of Taiwanese. Uh, they are willing to engage in the political dialogue, and they want to push Taiwan to a new and the right direction. And that is our freedom and democracy, of course. Today, we have a number of excellent speakers, including students from Taiwan, and we also have participants uh, in our workshop uh, last week. Uh, many of the students are from Taiwan. They are participated in the occupation of the legislature yen, and also they participate outside of the legislature yen uh, in, in the uh, Sunflower Movement. And these speakers are going to um, talk about a cross-strait relationship uh, and the regional security. In particular, I'd like to thank Randy Shriver, the project 2049, 2049 uh, for co-sponsoring the activity. Without his help, uh, we wouldn't be able to do uh, to to have a good meeting today. And uh, thank you, Randy. At this point, I want to turn the uh, panel forward to Garrett. He will introduce the uh, speakers or the first uh, discussion panel. Garrett. Thank you, Mark. Again, it's great to see uh, so many people here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Garrett Van Der Rees. I am with the Formosan Association for Public Affairs, and I'm also editor of Taiwan Communique, a very small publication, if I may do a little advertising here, that we have published since 1980, and we are focusing on the political developments in Taiwan and to get people outside of the United States, out of the sight of Taiwan, to understand what's going on inside Taiwan. It's exciting to be able to have an event like this, because it really shows that Taiwan still does have a very vibrant democracy. However, we too often take this democracy for granted. It's a very young democracy and it made its transition only 20 years ago. And I'm actually very happy to tell you that today at our event, we do have two people who were very instrumental in helping bring about that transition to democracy in Taiwan from the American side. Our Taiwanese friends, of course, remember Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator Clayburn Pell and the two aides who were really instrumental in those days are here with us today. Tom Hughes, right here. <laughs> Tom worked for Senator Clayburn Pell, and Tom Dine, who worked for Senator Ted Kennedy. Thank you, Tom and Tom, for your contributions. And I would like now to introduce the uh, panel. The first panel is about the motivating factors and domestic political implications. So what led to the events and what are the implications within Taiwan itself? And we have three excellent speakers to talk to us about that. The first one is Li Junta. Uh, hello, everyone. He was one of the student movement leaders inside the legislative UN, and he was part of the team that 
basically ran the show inside the LY from March 18th until April 10th. And after that, he co-founded an organization and is general coordinator for Democracy Tautin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Democracy Together. And that is charged with looking at the further developments and monitoring uh, the further developments in terms of uh, the agreements that are being concluded with China, how that is done. Is there a transparency there? The second speaker is Don Rogers, Professor Rogers right here of the, University of the uh, Austin College in Texas. Don has been involved in Taiwan matters for quite a long time, since 1982 when he first went to Taiwan and he's been back and forth many times, and he's really an expert on Taiwan's political system and Taiwan's elections. The third person who will contribute uh, to the discussion is Professor Vincent Wang. Vincent is right there, of the University of Richmond in Virginia. He also serves as Associate Dean in the School of Arts and Sciences at the university. He is an author of many books, and he has contributed many thoughts and ideas on developments in Taiwan, uh, cross-trade relations, and East Asia in general. So with these introductions, I would like to start uh, setting the stage in a little bit uh, about the uh, Sunflower Movement. And then after that, I'll give each one of you uh, the floor without further ado. And after that, we will have our second panel, and that will be moderated by uh, Joanna Yu and uh, with Randy Shriver and Patrick Cronin in the panel. Uh, that's the part two of the uh, event today. So setting the stage, what prompted the Sunflower Revolution? I think to many people in this country and even in Taiwan, it was quite a surprise uh, but if you look at the developments in Taiwan uh, more closely over the past years, then um, it was actually quite a long time in the making. And it was an accumulation of um, developments, tension, and an increasing unease about the direction uh, that the country is heading, both internally and uh, across the strait. And that was combined, I think, with the emergence of the very vocal civil society that we do have now. The early origins of that civil society can be traced back to 2008, when PRC envoy Chen Yunlin came to Taiwan, and the government basically didn't allow very much in terms of expression of concerns. They confiscated flags, people could not have an I Love Taiwan t-shirt, and many more things happened there. And that prompted basically two movements at that time, the Yellow Ribbon Campaign and the Wild Strawberry uh, Movement protest. Wild Strawberry got its name from the fact that prior to that, a lot of young people in Taiwan were considered the strawberry generation. If you touch them, you know, they were very sensitive. <laughs> didn't want to be involved in politics and, and so on and so forth. They just wanted to make money and get a good job, you know. But these people were very uh, vocal and they went into the streets, so they became the wild strawberries. Some people even trace the uh, new civil society in Taiwan back to the late 80s, early 90s, when you had the wild mountain lily movement in the spring of 1990, which really made a major contribution to the transition to democracy back in those days. And that movement itself was, again, inspired by both the fall of the Berlin Wall, where people said, hey, this is enough. We want to uh, move towards democracy in East Germany, and then uh, that was mirrored in Tiananmen in 1989. So a long history for the civil society movement in Taiwan. Then jumping back to 2008, um, from 2008 to 2012, there was a, basically, in the view of many, an erosion of good governance, an erosion of, oops, what's happening here? Oh, okay, 
my screen just jumped away, so I'll take that. Um, so uh, increasing erosion of good governance, of democracy, and of the judicial system, which also uh, led to an increasing stalemate in the legislative UN. Uh, that, in 2012, led to one of the early uh, civil society organizations, the anti-media monopoly campaign against the attempted takeover of Apple uh, by one, one China Times. And that was really one of the earlier times that a group of people and some of the sunflowers were also involved in that, uh, became active and started to say, hey, uh, not, uh, not now and not here. And they said that the encroachment of news media from China on Taiwan was not something that people in Taiwan really appreciated. Then we came to 2013, the summer of discontent, if I may call it that way, people taking to the streets in a much more massive fashion. Uh, we had the death of the conscript in uh, military custody, which led to the Citizens 1985 movement, one year after 84, where 84 was the government watching people, and here 85 people watching the government. The signing of the Surface Trade Agreement in itself already led at that time to pretty widespread protest uh, with the Black Island Nation group uh, in the lead. Nuclear power was a continuing story in a sense, and the forced demolition of homes in Taipei and Miaoli. So there were, on a variety of issues, a number of groups that were active. And all of this really culminated in the Sunflower Movement in March, uh, where people decided, hey, we want to not accept what is happening now, and uh, we will occupy the legislative Yen. And uh, there were basically, if I may summarize it very briefly, three reasons for that. One was the substance of the agreement. There were many people who spoke out against the agreement, including uh, Mr. Rex Howe, who was a big publisher in Taiwan. He was actually an advisor to Ma Ingeo, but he resigned because he felt that the president was going too far, too fast in China's direction and allowing, by allowing publi uh, publishing industry to be uh, taken over, basically, by uh, Chinese interests. Another person who spoke out pretty uh, vocally was the chairwoman of the economics department in Taiwan National University, highly respected economist, and she had statement after statement saying, hey, this is not good for Taiwan. So these were not rebel rousing students, you know, not, not these guys here, but th <laughs> those were really prominent people in, in the society. And last but not least, the underlying political agenda. Uh, China certainly saw it as a stepping stone towards unification and at least some parts in the Ma administration also looked at it in, in that fashion. So in conclusion, um, oh no, one more point here. They have brought support, as I said in uh, earlier. Uh, everybody saw the uh, report of the mass rally on March 30th with 500,000 people. Uh, polls in, uh, indicated pretty broad support and also around the world, there were many uh, rallies uh, in support of the students. This picture I took actually right here in front of Tecro on, uh, on Wisconsin uh, Avenue. Welcome here. Thank you. <laughs> um, then the conclusion. The essence is basically uh, a domestic component. People are concerned about the good governments, about uh, <coughs> lack of responsiveness and transparency a foreign component, the increasing unease about drift to China by the Ma administration, and then what really broke the camel's back, uh, that was the dysfunction of the legislative uh, UN. So with that, we go to uh, panel one, and I'd like to invite uh, Li Junta to give his presentation. He told me that he can talk about this for hours and hours <laughs> in Taiwanese. 
<laughs> and uh, of course, we have only 15 minutes. So he really made a very sophisticated 15-minute uh, uh, presentation, new media presentation. And this will be also, I hope I can say that, your first speech in English, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so let us welcome Junta. Look at the screen there. I don't know how to get this one. Okay, so. yeah. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm in Junta. So uh, I'm the one of the leaders of some form movement, and here I try to, to introduce you the be begin and the result of some form movement in only 15 minutes. And just uh, the result, the CISTA, the trade pack, or the service uh, trade agreement, which is al already mentioned by Gary, so I will not repeat it. Like this picture is what happened at the beginning. Who is this? In March 17th, under the pressure from President Ma, he's the congressman Zhang Qingzhong. He announced the trade pack is approved by internal committee in only 30 seconds, and nearby the bathroom, not in the meeting room. <laughs> <laughs> so this is too ridiculous for everyone in Taiwan. So the people decide to have some action. But at the first, at the beginning, it just was a summary. We outside of the legislative UM, the people give speech. Uh, the band gave the music performance. But in the middle of the ceremony, the activists grew up and entered the legislative UN and occupied it. And this, so we call the Sound Farm Movement. But what is Sound Farm Movement? Actually, just a little bit excellent. Because there's a, uh, a forest, he sent his flower to, into the chamber building, and then we put it up the, on the stacks like here, and then the media called it some form movement. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the picture, the, the Peter Huang, the gentleman speak, I think a lot of people here know him. He's in charge of us during the, that time. And this movement demands that adequate legislative monitor any negotiation between Taiwan and China, because we know the interact between Taiwan and China is necessary, but it should not be anything goes. It should be monitored by a good legal process. So that's what we want. And also, we want to stop the procedure of the trap pack until the regulation was done. And also, we want a, a civil constitutional assembly, because we think it's not only an economic issue. It's also a political issue and national security issue. OK, time is the March 18th. I believe the most people here didn't enter the building, so I will try to use this picture to show how it works inside. First, okay, that's me, and yeah, my position in the movement actually is I'm trying to build in the division of labor here because there are hundreds of volunteers, activists inside the building, and we have to work 24-7. So we stay there whole day, of, of, for almost three, more than three weeks. And so I'm also the coordinator inside of the building to maintain the working site. And also the member of decision-making group because we have to respond to the government, the society, to decide what to do next. Of course, when we enter the building, there are police want to try to break our defense, trying to clean up us. And we have a security team to build a barrier to secure the gate from the police. At the first, the police try to enter the building for several times, but they all failed. Then that's why we stay there for longer. <laughs> and also, once we against the government, we need to tell more people in the Taiwan, the whole society, what happened. We need their support. So we have a media team and information team to arrange to hold the media info interview and manage the social network to mobilize the people come to support us. 
And we also need to collect all the information, no matter it's from government or from the people, from the citizen. <coughs> Help us to do the right decision. And hundreds of people inside the building, and we have to leave. So we have a material team to manage the food supply and donations to keep everybody alive. The donation is tons and tons float in. So there's a very tough chance to manage it of that. OK. And we have to survive, and we have to keep everybody in healthy condition. So look here, we have a lot, lots of doctor and nurse. We have a medical team here. Yes, there's not only volunteer or students inside the building, but also a lot of professional staff that have a team to come in to help us. So there are a hundred of doctors and nurses involved, is involved and in including the Western and uh, Oriental therapy. So I even have the acupuncture <laughs> inside the <laughs> chamber. So, yeah. And there are more than five medical stations inside and outside of the chamber building because there are a lot, lot of people around the building. So they have and stay there 24-7 as well. And also, the medical team stay here 24-7. Lots of them, after their the rotation in the chamber building, and then they have to go to hospital for work. So that's really appreciated for them. And in this kind of action, we know there will be a lot of legal issue. Of course, so we have more than 400 lawyers to join us as the volunteer attorney to for the activists who are charged by government like me and some people are here. And they're also in charge of the government of the police plurality. And at the beginning, in the side of the chamber building, there was no internet connection. So there are a few engineers and programmers that just set up the cable from outside into the building to provide us the stable internet. So internet is what we need for arise more people awareness. It's necessary, so we're very thankful for that as well. I think there are a lot of information you read is provided by this team. It's the international media team. We have over 100,000 people involved and tot totally over like 14 languages, including English, of course, Germany, Japanese, French, Spanish, even the Arabic and Russian. And they're also in charge of the interview from CNN, BBC, and so on. So quite a professional team, huh? And of course, there are a bunch, bunch of media stay here, look at the camera. There are booming coverage during this time. There's even 24 hours live cast show, just like Truman Show, the movie. <laughs> yeah. Almost every media in Taiwan involved it, no matter if it's the independent one or mainstream ones. Even the media who usually pro government, they still stay inside for 24 hours. So there are also all the internet react from how the forum focused on this movement and the numbers of Facebook fans page, well, we scroll up to 100 times. And back to timeline. And even we, we occupy the legislature UN for one week, and the government don't have any response, any positive response at all. And by the 23rd, the President Ma says, the students are illegal, and the traffic is going to pass anyway in the press conference. So there's not a good response at all. The people getting angry more. So they decide to do another occupation. They try to occupy the executive yuan, but there are already 300 more right police waiting there. And the midnight is really a long night for whole Taiwanese because there are violence on the non-violent activists and journalists and even a uh, legislator inside the, the executive yuan. They use the rod to hit the people on hit, who is non-violent, like this. But people in Taiwan, the citizens in Taiwan, did not scare. And they grew up, and they stand up to fight to the government in a peaceful way, again. So there are more than 500,000 people rally before the 
president's building, just like the picture. I believe a lot, a lot of people want and already be in the, the rally. But how can this be? How is this possible? Look at the momentum of the, the crowd, the people. Even the raining day during this time, there are all the, a lot of people are feel around the legislative UM, try to defend the occupation action to keep it still going, going. And, and this also area created the citizen involvement. Like this, this is a civil constitutional assembly. We try to do that on the street. And there are a lot of NGOs come to her us to talk about different issues, no matter it's labor issue or environmental issue or human rights issue. So people get involved. So they keep their momentum. And we have to mention that all of this work at the beginning of the action is all helped by the lot of NGOs. Like I mentioned, no matter environmental one, labor one, or human rights, they all support in, and involved in this action. Almost every NGO in Taiwan involved in. So that make all this possible. And one week after we, we rally with the 500,000, half million people. And uh, finally, the, pres the government has response, but not from the President Ma ying but from the chairman of Legislative Yuan, who is Wang Jinping. He came to the chamber building and agrees the trap pack will return to the committee. And the procedure will not get advanced before the regulation of the cross this straight agreement was done. And that's the partly successful for us. We finally did something, but not whole. But we decided to leave the chamber building by 10. And to, we, we want to maintain the momentum, so the civil group was at the split, such like the economic project the projects want to impeach some legislator, which is support the trap pack and without any any democracy procedure, and the Taiwan march and democracy doubting. And however, here I have a shortly end here. Why we call some form of movement as the new political landscape? The first, it creates the third force behind two party, the TPP and KMT and they also have the mass mobilization ability. And also he, he emphasized on the transparency and the better check and balance of the power, which means we don't rely on the, any party. Like before, we try to make the democracy right by our own self. And we try to preserve the democracy and the Taiwanese identity and the sovereignty. And all of these are in danger since the China's power is getting bigger and bigger and which we want to stop is the draft of Taiwan to China as an envisioned by the KMT and CCP. <coughs> so it also shows the post martial law generation, the young people, they get, gather and showed up to fight for their own country and the future. Okay, that's a short end here. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
um, drawing attention to, but ultimately, as we hear, trying to change policy, trying to way, change the way that government is making decisions and some of the decisions that government are making. So we're going to talk about this and talk about a little bit of the changing political environment. Is it changing, and what will that mean for the future? So we're going to look at, uh, Garrett's already touched on this, we talked about this a little bit already, but what motivated the protests? And what are some of the things that the students and the other young people and the workers are protesting about? And then what will this affect the elections and how should the parties respond or how will they respond? We don't know how they will respond yet. We can talk about maybe how they should respond and then we'll talk about how voters might respond to this um, and how and how whether and how this will affect voting behavior in Taiwan in the next few years. Now looking at the protests and again Garrett's touched on this a bit already and I'm going to fly through some slides of different protests that have been going on for the past few years. And I agree with Garrett, for people who have been observing Taiwan politics for a while, really the emergence of these protests isn't too surprising. There has been this simmering discontent, right? And it was just, I think, a matter of time before people started hitting the streets uh, and protesting. And I, back in 2010, I did a survey of the college students um, of their political attitudes, and it was 941 students across 14 different universities. And in that survey, I saw that, right, that discontent, that dissatisfaction, and that concern about the direction the country was taking. So it wasn't too surprising. Um, the, but the issues that sparked the protests, one of the things that particularly outside observers of Taiwan make the mistake in assuming is that all, all, all these protests are about China relations, Taiwan-China relations. And in fact, that's not the case. Much of the, of the motivation for the protests really has to do with domestic political factors. And yes, the Taiwan-China relations are a big part of that, but it has to do with the bigger issues of transparency and government decision making and democracy and, and the responsiveness of the government to the interests and to the desires of the Taiwanese people. It's not just the government. There's also dissatisfaction with the Democratic Progressive Party, right? And I see all the young people nodding their heads, so this is something we'll talk about. Um, but it's not just about cross-strait issues. So we go through again, the, and again, Garrett talked, uh, touched on this, so I'll fly through. A number of the different protests, the anti-media monopoly, uh, the Loshan Lo, Lo Sanitarium um, protests about that, that situ, DAPU, the demolition of private homes, a pri property right issue, uh, the nuclear power issue, um, the death of the corporal, um, the workers, the workers of the closed factories, the shoe throwers, right? Again, I talked the other day, I love those guys. <laughs> Collecting shoes myself. Uh, Miramar Resort, which has to do with land rights, indigenous rights, um, and, and um, wealth issues and wealth distribution issues. Uh, Hua Guang community, another um, property right issue, government demolition of private property kind of issue. Um, and then finally we get to the big explosion, what we refer to now as the Sunflower Movement, which is really in many ways a culmination of, of these other things that was really focused on the cross-strait service trade agreement, but not just that, right? It, it addressed a number of different issues. And I said it was a coalition of a lot of different movement groups, a lot of non-governmental organizations, a lot of social movements that came together to, to focus on this. And it drew everybody's attention, of course, because they occupied a government building. Um, and if it hadn't been for the, the Malaysian Airlines tragedy that was occurring simultaneously, this would have drawn a lot more international media attention. You know, it's unfortunate in many ways, of course. So, the important note, again, is that the, the protests um, were not strictly about cross-strait relations, Taiwan-China relations, but a lot of other issues that are, in a sense, more important, more salient, uh, more immediate to the Taiwanese voters. And so we look at a lot of things. We see in all the survey data, we're seeing an increasing concern with the wealth gap in Taiwan, um, in the United States too. But um, housing, the cost of housing, this is a big issue for young people. It's a big issue for everybody. The cost of housing is increasing. Salaries are remaining flat or declining, and people can't afford that. Um, employment issues, environmental issues, education, and the educational system. Um, land and property rights, the transparency broadly, the transparency of government decision making, and then again broadly democracy, social justice, and human rights issues. These are all the issues that people in Taiwan are talking about. And regardless of the particular issue they're focusing on, whether again it's property rights or nuclear power, broadly environmental rights, they're all paying attention to these last two things. How transparent is the government? How well is the government working? 
And of course, the consensus, as we'll see, is that the government isn't working well, and that neither party is really very well respected right now by the majority of people in Taiwan. Um, Dennis Huang from Commonwealth Magazine uh, had a commentary in April of 2014, and I think he provided this outstanding list of the things that motivated the protests, the various protests that are going on in Taiwan. And I won't read through all of them, but I'll let you see. You'll see, though, again, the issue of transparency, the ineffectiveness of the government. And this talks, in a sense, specifically about the Ma government, but also pointing its finger at the legislature, at the Li Fa Yuan, and the inability of the two parties to work. Um, the growing dependence on China, the failure of political parties to counterbalance each other, the dominance of executive power, the sense that the executive branch, the presidency, is deaf, not listening to the people at all, and then the favoring of party over political will, the sense that certainly within the KMT, but also within the DPP, that the party leaders are more concerned about internal party dynamics than they are about listening to the voters and listening to the people they're supposed to be representing. And this, these are common concerns you hear across Taiwan and reinforced in poll after poll after poll about what's going on in Taiwan politics. So we see party satisfaction. They're doing a little better than the United States Congress, <laughs> um, which is not, not hard. You know, again, U.S. Congress, I think, is currently slightly less popular than the cockroach. And so the... Um, <laughs> The, so we see that, but the KMT is, d is doing worse. Um, but neither party really has strong support, obviously. Dissatisfaction, um, dissatisfaction with both political parties is fairly high, higher with the KMT. Of course, the KMT is in power, so they're, they're going to draw more of that tension as well. Now, in this, this is a Taiwan Brain Trust poll, and Taiwan Brain Trust is a green um, green-leaning think tank, but I think that they, in presenting this poll that they did, they brought up some specific questions about what do you like or what do you not like about the, very, about the two political parties. So the strengths of the, of, the, of the DPP are seen as its Taiwan-centric stance, its support, its traditional support for farmers and workers, for the average working person, and then its support for democracy. The weaknesses, hard to argue with, factional infighting, lack of policy direction, and scarcity of skilled politicians. And I think all of these are accurate criticisms or concerns about the party. The KMT, the strengths, cross-strait policy, eh, we'll see about that. Now, these are people who are fa in favor of the party. And economic policy, ironically, one of the weaknesses is also economic policy. Um, people are divided on that issue. It's either good or bad. I guess it depends how much money you're making off the current economic policy. Uh, ineffectual governance. And this goes back to the early years of the Ma administration. And then corruption. And recent polls, um, TSR just did a poll recently, um, security research poll, that showed that, that um, the average, the respondents showed much more sense of corruption within the KMT than in the DPP, which is a little bit of a flip from what it was a few years ago. So higher sense of corruption in the KMT now than before. So the parties, what problems do they have? The, the KMT has a problem of, of this structural problem, in a sense. The sense of hierarchy. Um, the nepotism. Who are the leaders? Who are the emerging leaders in the KMT? Happen to be the sons of some of the departing leaders, <laughs> older leaders. And, and that is a concern that people have. A lack of responsiveness. They're not listening to the voters. It's a closed system. They're talking to each other. It's an echo chamber. And they're not reaching out and listening to the voters. Um, and again, the party loyalty, the party discipline at the expense of representation. It's astonishing that a KMT representative from southern Taiwan would continue to support President, Ma, President Ma's policies when 85% of his or her voters don't want him or to, her to do so. But the party loyalty is so strong that, again, loyalty to the, within the party is more important or more powerful than representation of the voices of your voters locally. And this is a big concern for the party at the present time. But will the KMT change? Well, they keep winning elections, so maybe they aren't going to. You know, ask, okay, why, why? we win, why should we change? Obviously, something's working right. But the question we have to ask in the context of the Sunflower Movement, has the environment changed enough that the KMT is going to have to change? to respond differently uh, than it has in the past. 
um, are, are the voters different now? Are the voters going to think differently now? Are they going to respond differently um, to the campaigns and to what the parties are doing in the next few years? Will people change from what they looked like back in 2008, 2012, uh, and going into 2014 now? Um, the, the question, um, I'm going to frame this very quickly in an academic kind of way, um, talking about the notion of affective intelligence. And I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. We can ask questions if you want. Basically, voters are habitual, right? We vote based on habit. We, it is very difficult for us to change our patterns. And that habit may include not paying much attention to politics, not being very interested in politics. But it takes something, and it happens occasionally, that there's a fairly large shock to the system that sort of wakes you up and your surveillance system kicks in, and you move away from your dispositions, from your habits, and you start paying attention to politics in a different way. You start paying more attention to detail. You start feeling a little bit of anxiety or stress over what's going on. Your life isn't going as well. Things are not going as well. You don't feel as confident in the system, and then you start to pay more attention. That's what may be happening in Taiwan now. We may see, we have high voter turnout in Taiwan, but we don't necessarily have exceptionally attentive voters. They don't necessarily pay close attention to all of the issues. They tend to vote out of habit, out of partisan loyalty, out of a local loyalty or personal relationships. That's what may change now. They may, change, they may pay attention to politics in a different way. So the studies show that if we do feel anxiety, we are more likely to pay attention to what's happening. And, and in politics, we're much more likely to pay attention to specific policy discussions and not just pay attention to whether we like the way that politician looks or if we had a personal relationship with them or if, if we vote, always voted for that party. We may pay more attention to what the politicians are talking about, what they're proposing, and the kind of policy direction they're going to take. This, again, is what I think we may be see emerge, seeing to emerge in Taiwan now is this greater attentiveness to what's happening and greater concern about the status quo two kinds of status quo, right? There's that cross-strait status quo that is fictional, and then there's the status quo domestically about how we behave politically. Um, and, and if there's enough anxiety stress, we may move away from our political habits. So it works this way, and I won't spend time on this, but basically we, we filter this, and if we feel down on the bottom right, emotion, emotions of anxiety and unease, we are more likely to change the way we do politics, the way we think about politics, and the way we behave. So we have to first have this willingness to change. Is there a willingness to change in Taiwan now? Are voters willing to pay attention to politics in a different way? Are they willing to hold their leaders accountable in a different way than they have been in the past? And that may be emerging, we think. Are people anxious enough, nervous enough, upset enough to break from their habits? And will people pay closer attention to the political processes? And so what's causing, I think there is high anxiety, what's causing it? We've seen a change in perceptions. Going back to 2008, 2012, the big anxiety was that if we elect the DPP, we're going to have a war with China. That's what they were being told, right? The KMT was perceived as a stable, effective kind of leadership, status quo, calm, efficient. That's changed, obviously. Now we see there's a perception of the failed leadership of the KMT, all of the issues that were listed above that people are unhappy with. We see that 60 to 80 percent of the people in Taiwan, depending on the polls, supported the protest movements, believe the movements were good for democracy. And then there's the DPP. Now we don't know about the DPP yet. The DPP has to be careful. One might assume by looking at this that the DPC, DPP's got it made going into 2014, 2016. But that's not the case. The young people who are protesting, and a lot of the protesters, unhappy with the KMT, but are not necessarily going to automatically cast their vote for the DPP, and the DPP needs to pay attention to that. So real quickly, what, the, what can we do? Is either party going to address these issues? The DPP has to demonstrate more unity. It has to come out with clearer policy stances. It has to focus on these economic and social justice issues that are so important to people. And it has to return to its grassroots a little bit with better community organization and outreach. That's, that's essential for the party if it wants to win. The DPP tied to the movements. It needs to find a way to benefit from the movements, but it can't make itself a branch of the movements or vice versa. 
right? It has to t take the issues the movements have been talking about and put them front, front and center in its campaigns uh, to try to gain support. It can't follow. So it's got to do this. Now, in DPP's China policy, it, it needs to emphasize the fact that we're going to try to work with China, but it's going to be transparent, and we're going to be cautious. The KMT. No longer can the KMT present ties with China as a panacea for all of Taiwan's problems, which is kind of what we've heard for the last few years. The original support for Ma was based on this idea that if, if we have Ma reaching out to China, it's going to solve our economic problems. It's going to improve our economy. We're all going to do better. There was also that barrier, that limitation on how far he could go because of the political sensitivity of it. What's happened, you know, he had a very short-term benefit here that said the people, the voters were basically saying, do this stuff with China, and if we see immediate economic, tangible economic benefit, we'll be okay with it. If we don't, you better watch out. Well, the benefit hasn't been there. Perception of benefit hasn't been there. And then, but the perception that Ch he's moving too quickly, too close to China is there. So he's getting cut back on. So the, the KMT has to start to listen to the voters. It has to give more attention to domestic issues, and it has to convince the voters that it's going to be calm and cautious in its moves toward China, and not just throw everything there and say, this is going to solve all of our problems. So voting behavior. I'll end with this. The appendectomy project that was mentioned is a brilliant thing. It is an, a project that is drawing attention to the fact that there are leaders who are not representing our interests, and we must hold them accountable. Right? And so this is something that we'll see. Uh, in Taiwan, and quite often here too, but leaders get elected and then people sort of let them go. They don't pay attention to them until the next election comes around. The movements have maybe shifted that, and there may be greater attention paid on a day-to-day -day basis to what those leaders are doing. Are they responding to us? Are they listening to us? Are they representing our interests? This is what we'll see if the voters do. So the voters have to be willing to hold the leaders accountable. It's more likely going into 2014 and 2016 elections than it was 2008 to 2012, but it's not guaranteed that will happen. The efforts of the movements and the different organizations now that have sprung out to keep that front and center is going to be essential to see how the elections go. The voters then will be less likely to accept vague, vague promises, and ultimately this will lead to potentially better democracy in Taiwan. Right? And this is what we can watch over the next few years. I think the stage is set for it, but how it works out will depend on how the two parties respond to it and how the voters respond as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don, for a very clear and concise analysis. Now we have Vincent from your perspective. Do okay. you need no, to? I don't. To that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so you can see the declining quality of <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, uh, thanks uh, FAPA and uh, Project 2049 uh, for inviting me. And um, it's great to see uh, so many uh, students from Taiwan, especially the student leaders. And uh, you make me uh, feel very uh, hopeful about my country. So anyway, um, I, I'm going to speak as a political scientist, and I think I'm actually going to end on the same note uh, as Don, that uh, despite the apparent uh, surprise or chaos and so on, I rather see what happened in Taipei uh, in Taiwan uh, two months ago as a safety valve, and it, it is actually a waking moment. All the senses are awakened, and that uh, the, the society can re-examine uh, Taiwan's young democracy, and hopefully this will work out some of the uh, the, the, the problems uh, in Taiwan's young democracy. My comments are going to li uh, be limited to two aspects. One is uh, maybe sort of an armchair analysis of the factors contributing to the Sunflower Movement. And the other aspect is to speculate a little bit, uh, as Don did, uh, about uh, the Sunflower Movement's impact on Taiwan's domestic politics. Uh, we are told not to predict, but I'm going to step up a little bit to predict a little bit. So um, what contributed to the Sunflower Movement uh, had both the broader factor and the immediate factor. The broader factor, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, is a growing sense uh, of unease about the modality, speed, and the scope 
of uh, expanding uh, cross-strait relations uh, under the Ma Ying-jeou administration. First, in terms of modality, uh, Ma Ying-jeou administration um, mentioned uh, had the importance about stabilizing cross-strait relations and expanding economic relationship is actually a pillar, an important pillar. But the modality started with a vision embraced by the two ruling parties across the Taiwan Strait, namely the KMT and the CCP. Uh, beginning with the 2005 uh, Lianhu Joint Declaration, and then uh, uh, as soon as the KMT uh, came back to power in 2008, the two semi-official organizations, uh, Strait uh, Exchange Foundation and the uh, Association of Relations Across the Taiwan Strait, quickly uh, resumed their contact and dialogue based on the so-called 1992 consensus. Whatever that was the two sides agreed to uh, in 1992 is still a matter of debate. But nonetheless, uh, SEF and ARAS were able to resume contact and uh, Lo and behold, they, uh, the Ma, Ma administration uh, proudly say that they have, under this basis, they have signed 21 uh, agreements, including the 2010 uh, ECFA, which the Ma administration also said that the cross-strait service trade agreement is only a follow-up. In fact, they have a few more follow-up, such as the merchandise trade agreement, dispute settlement, uh, and uh, investment protection, and so on. Um, but. I think that there is a, what, I think most Taiwanese people will probably not disagree with uh, President Ma, the, the importance about uh, maintaining uh, a good working relationship with the mainland, and they probably will not disagree that the rise of China is a reality. As a matter of fact, whoever is in power in Taiwan uh, must face this reality, and probably will not disagree with him on his approach, basic approach, namely uh, the so-called uh, first, the urgent, then the less urgent. First, the easy, then the difficult. First, economics, and then politics. So, uh, in Chinese, xian ji hou huan, xian yi hou nan, and xian jing hou zheng. I don't think this, these are very arguable. However, uh, there is a growing sense that the low hanging fruits have been reaped, and the cross strait relations are entering more difficult uh, areas. In fact, there is a momentum that the, t the government in Taipei may not be able to be in control. Uh, I'm just going to cite a, uh, a poll by the Mainland Affairs Council, which of course is government agency in, in charge of cross-strait relations. And you know, they, they often do this poll, so you know, that they will say that uh, more than 88% of the Taiwanese people favor a broadly defined status quo, which is still true. But they also ask the respondents in Taiwan do you think that the, sp the, the pace of cross-strait relations are too fast or just about right or too slow? And according to the March 14 uh, poll, uh, 48, 45% of the Taiwanese uh, respondents say the pace is just about right. And then 31% say it's too fast. And 14% is too, say it's too slow. I think that even though still more people, a plurality of people think the pace is right, but you will also notice that more people feel that it is too fast. So there is genuinely a concern about the speed being too fast. And I think that there's also a, a concern about the scope that cross-strait relations have really expanded uh, into many areas and uh, uh, that uh, people in Taiwan are generally concerned about globalization through China. Uh, I mean, I think this is actually a sort of a, you know, uh, uh, ridicule, but but just look at, just take a look at the, uh, the flight bulletin information uh, at Taoyuan International Airport. I think about 80 or 90 percent of the, the flight cities are actually cities on the mainland. And if you're not careful, you might mistake this as a sort of a domestic uh, airport, right? And uh, so I think that th there is that. We, we, we will not lose sight of that. So there is apparently uh, evidently, a disconnect between President Ma's apparent reasonable, rational case and the public worries, fears, and the skepticism. This is compounded by two additional factors. One is that Taiwan's economy is no longer uh, the miracle as it w once was. So the, e the Taiwan's economy has not been performing well, as, as Don mentioned, a lot of uh, public um, 
uh, concerns about uh, their own livelihood and so on. So the economy is losing luster. And economy used to be KMT's strong suit, but now they cannot deliver on the economy. And then you also have an uh, incumbent who is uh, very uh, unpopular. I'm talking about President Ma, who is very um, unpopular and seemingly increasingly uh, isolated. I don't think either one of these uh, will help the matter. The cross-strait service trade agreement presents special problem. So yes, the protesters were concerned about non-transparent procedures and so on. But I think that in terms of substance, this agreement also presents problem. The government, of course, of course says that the service trade agreement is only a follow-up of the ECFA. It also say, say that it will create jobs. Uh, it will also uh, present uh, Taiwan's service industry, which now constitutes 70 percent of uh, Taiwan's GDP, and export opportunity, which was previously not the case, because previously Taiwan's exports were primarily merchandise trade. Um, opponents, of course, fear that uh, the fruits of the service trade agreement are not broadly shared. Uh, they will favor uh, the conglomerates. And they will also have an immediate impact on media freedom and the freedom of expression. In fact, uh, inviting the Chinese investments in certain sensitive sectors, such as transportation, telecommunication, uh, and airlines, and so on, actually present special national security considerations, and so on. Of course, the immediate catalyst was, as Junda mentioned, the, the, the attempt to try to ram through the legislature. And it is also quite clear that the a partisan uh, uh, rancor between the KMT and the DPP uh, was a contributing factor. You ha also have the fissure within the ruling party, uh, the political rivalry between uh, President Ma and the Speaker Wang Jinping. And basically, Taiwan has a dysfunctional legislature. Uh, the citizens are actually fed up with these, uh, the institution that is supposed to represent them and make important decisions. And Taiwan's uh, experience with the civil society uh, has also gained maturity. So how will the uh, sunflower movement change or uh, have any impact on Taiwan's uh, domestic political landscape? I think the conventional wisdom will say that uh, the opposition party, which is the DPP, uh, is supposed to stand to gain. However, I want to caution you, as Don mentioned, that the sunflower movement was very careful to distance uh, themselves from either party. The, the either, neither party is actually doing their job. The, the ruling party is ineffective. The opposition party is far from being a loyal opposition. And when they switch places, they continue to put their partisan uh, rancor above national interests. Um, so this, in this regard, the Sunfall Movement is actually remarkably independent and mature. They present uh, the Taiwan people with a potential third force they keep both KMT and the DPP at a distance. And politics in Taiwan may have uh, entered what Ronald Inglehart, uh, the <coughs> University of Michigan political scientist, called the postmodern politics, namely that, that traditional parties no longer represent the people. Rather, politics are governed by single issue advocacy groups. And people are more concerned about quality of life issues look at the issues that they represent over the years rather than uh, the single-minded uh, concern for growth, which was Taiwan's formula in the 1970s and the 80s, right? So whether the, they are not necessarily, um, I think that the, these advocacy groups, the postmodern uh, politics, are not necessarily firmly in either party's uh, camp. In fact, if I would argue that Taiwan uh, does not have a genuine left leftist party, although the DPP you know, uh, seems to do a better job in terms of at least give the appearance of uh, caring about the farmers and the workers and so on. And the, the, these uh, advocacy might even coalesce into small parties in the European context, such as the Green Party. Uh, and of course, in European politics, you know that sometimes Green parties can play an important decisive role in coalition politics. But the political landscape in Taiwan is very different. Up until now, perhaps in the foreseeable future, it is going to be continued dominated by the two parties, right? the KMT and the DPP. How will these political parties respond to these demands of the movement and whether they can uh, incorporate some of these demands into policy? It is understandable that these either 
uh, KMT and the, the DPP, the sort of a catch-all political parties, are trying to co-opt some of the demands uh, into um, their platform. Uh, however, uh, it is difficult. Uh, it, will be, it, it remains to be seen whether the Sunflower Movement can actually uh, transform themselves from a political movement into a body of governance. You know, to govern is actually, it requires a lot more. Nationwide organization, network, finance, and so on. They are masters of social media, okay? Which already, you know, Jinda has already demonstrated. Um, and I should also caution you that uh, historically, third parties in Taiwan have not fared very well. Does anybody remember uh, the purple uh, and uh, the, the red shirt and so on? I, I'm not saying that the Sunflower Movement is thinking about becoming a third party, but in terms of the uh, politics have been dominated in, you know, by the two big parties in Taiwan for too long. The Sunflower Movement care about the procedure uh, more than the substance, and they, they mentioned the importance of the monitoring law but apparently, both the KMT and the DPP accept that. So now it's just a matter of whether uh, they can agree, as the, the English sayings uh, have it, the, de the, the devils are in the details, whether they can agree on a version of the monitoring law in the legislature so that then once that, that is in place, then they can uh, review the service trade agreement line by line, right? This is the, what they are agreed to. How will this affect the election uh, later this year, uh, or 2016. I'm, see, I'm trying to do the homework that uh, Garrett assigned me. Um, is it possible that the Sunflower Movement uh, proved to be the last straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak? Uh, it remains to be seen. Because the general uh, political atmosphere now is not very much in favor of the KMT. The, you have a central government that is not very effective and certainly uh, has been rendered even weaker by, the, by what happened in, in Taipei two months ago. Um, but so it, will this actually contribute to the KMT's predicted loss in the year-end uh, uh, local elections? I don't know. But if the KMT will lose, it will lose on its own weight. I'm, I'm sure that the Sunflower Movement is only contribute to that. Uh, how about China? Uh, how about the China factor in uh, Taiwan's election? Well, um, in, in Taiwan, uh, even though you have the distinction between the local elections and the presidential central election, the conventional wisdom is that the local elections are all about local politics. But as, as this case in this indicated, there's no longer the distinction between cross-strait politics and local politics. All politics are local, right? And uh, uh, I think that the, the, despite the apparent setback, now you see that the CCP uh, has uh, continued its unwavering approach toward Taiwan. It's, it's, it's a setback, but that doesn't mean that they have changed their fundamental uh, attitude. Their fundamental policy remains to unify with Taiwan. In fact, as we speak, uh, the Taiwan Affairs Office head, Zhang Zhijun, is visiting Taiwan, and uh, they have apparently uh, learned some lessons from the Sunflower Movement. They know that it is not sufficient to simply try to uh, make economic concessions to Taiwan, so-called rang li. Rang li is in, in, insufficient. Uh, you, need, you, you also need to win the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people. They have become more sophisticated. They focus on the so-called san zhong, yi qing, so uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprise, uh, central and southern Taiwan, and uh, the middle class, and of course the youth. So I think the, the upshot is that the challenge faced by Taiwan, whoever that is going to be in power in 2016, blue or green, is only going to be greater because you, have a, uh, you, have, you are facing a China who will continue to rise, whose uh, basic design for Taiwan has remained unchanged, and then it has also learned to become more sophisticated. So I hope uh, what happened in Taipei two months ago will actually give the opposition and the ruling party and the society in Taiwan in general an opportunity to think about whether they can uh, come up with a better strategy of truly defending their hard-earned democracy and prosperity amidst the growing challenge from China. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Vincent, and also the other speakers for your excellent insights and uh, thinking uh, about what's happening in Taiwan and looking towards the future. All speakers also did an excellent job in staying within the 15 uh, minutes. Mm -hmm. So we do have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, there are roving microphones, so maybe one of them on the left side and the other microphone on this side. And uh, what I'd like you to do is, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll uh, recognize you and then state your name and, if necessary, affiliation and have a very brief question if it's to a particular speaker, name the speaker. So with that, uh, yes, right here in the middle. Hi, um, my name is Karen Montague. I'm from the Potomac Foundation. My question is about voting. Uh, I know that we said we shouldn't predict, but I want to maybe get a better understanding of what we can maybe expect uh, in 2016. But my question is uh, having to do with the re-election of Ma Ying-jeou uh, when it's passed. It, my understanding is very um, limited as far as what I could read in the media. Uh, we all know that we shouldn't really trust the media too much. But I, the way I understand it is that the conglomerates and the business uh, people in, in Taiwan had a had a major factor in him being reelected with everyone's hopes for uh, cross strait relations, you know, more business with China, business, 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 all about business people. Uh, so my question for as far as 2016, how do, we exp how do we think that these businesses and conglomerates that might still be putting faith in maybe the KMT for cross strait relations and businesses with China, or business with China, um, was this, will this be uh, a polling factor that could see maybe the KMT reelected, despite the students' movement, the sunflower protest, and obvious dissatisfaction with how the KMT has been running things, and the speed and the non-transparency with the um, agreements that the KMT is trying to make uh, with with China uh, businesses? Do they have a, a big pull in 2016? Business I, impact, yes, done. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment real quickly on that. It, it, in my talk, I talked about the wealth gap. And one of the big issues related to the wealth gap is the sense that in these relations with China, the, the benefits that have been accrued are going to the top. So we're seeing an increasing division of wealth, and the, the benefits of cross-strait trade are really going to a very small percentage of businesses and people in, in Taiwan. And this is the larger these are the larger businesses. Part of the concern about the cross-strait uh, service trade agreement was that it was going to have a profound and potentially n very negative impact on the smaller and medium-sized enterprises in the service sector. Um, yes, yeah, so I would assume that the large businesses are, are still going to have strong interest in promoting um, uh, cross-strait trade, but the, the, the KMT has to be very careful about that because they could even further alienate the middle class um, they could even further alienate the people who are very concerned about this wealth gap um, by placing too much emphasis on, on that, on that cross-strait trade. So it could backfire on them. Um, I would assume, yes, that the same people who supported the KMT, the, the large businesses that, that are going to benefit from the cross-strait trade, um, international businesses, and even the U.S. to some extent on that, will do so. But it's not necessarily, not necessarily going to have uh, as positive an impact on the outcome for the KMT as it did in 2012. Vincent, you want to add to that? Um, I, I largely agree with uh, Don, and I think that the um, uh, what I'm uh, a little bit concerned is uh, that the, the the CCP has learned to be very sophisticated. They know they have already learned that their previous strategy has only yielded to a few. Uh, conglomerates that are doing very well. Of course, the, 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 the ruling party in Taiwan can say that, you know, cross-strait uh, uh, agreement is good, but the benefits are very concentrated rather than diffuse, right? So you, the, the CCP now can actually, um, I, I think it will be a challenge to see how they can spread the benefits a little bit more. It will be very difficult for uh, the ordinary Taiwanese to feel that what do I gain from this? I mean. I, until that happens, uh, I think that this perception of that the cross-strait uh, economic uh, interactions benefit a few is not going to change. And I, I don't think that the 2016 
um, election will, uh, yes, the China, China factor is very important, but I think uh, voters are more likely to vote on their um, perception of the performance that this uh, ruling party has been uh, doing. And, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, the general atmosphere now is not very in favor, uh, is not very favorable to the KMT. Just, um, Vincent, just one more point. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier the uh, visit of Zhang Zhijin, mm -hmm. and uh, just want to mention that the New York Times has a article today in Taiwan, Chinese official confronted with the voice of democracy. So that's, I think, rather interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have uh, one here and then in the back. First up here, the gentleman in the green shirt. Uh, hi, my name is Ben. Uh, I work for Senator Markey from Massachusetts. Um, my question is with regards to the CCP's handling um, of the issues of Vietnam and the Spratly Islands and then in uh, Japan with the Senkaku, the Ayu Islands, uh, where the lines between sort of energy and commerce and security start blurring with regards to sort of maritime disputes. Um, what are the different sort of stances of the KMT and the DPP on how they would handle those sort of situations between the CCP and Taiwan's security interests in the East and South China Sea? I think if I want to refer this question to the next panel, because that's really a, a, a question that will be dealt with in the regional security, and you have some uh, excellent experts in the next panel. And Joanna, who is sitting right next behind you, will be moderating. <laughs> so she's keeping good uh, touch with you. In the back, the gentleman with the blue. Uh, Mr. Lloyd Solis, University of Maryland. Uh, regarding the Taiwanese diaspora, and with the Taiwanese all over the world, um, what are the ideas and actions of the Taiwanese regarding the domestic and political situations in the homeland? I mean, Taiwan. Thank you. Don, maybe you can elaborate on that, how the people overseas uh, see developments in the homeland and what yeah. they are. Finally, things good, good. Democracy and human rights and social justice, and finally, things are looking positive. I have hope for the future. Um, the, 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 my perception of the Taiwanese American community, um, the older generation particularly, has been that sort of the perception of you guys as son of, of strawberries. You know, beautiful on the outside, easily bruised, and not interested in politics. I've been trying to tell them, in my opinion, no, I think you're wrong about that. I think they're very astute about politics. And so finally, thankfully, they proved me right. You know, And um, for the first time in my political science career, I was correct about something. I was very excited. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I think, I think that, that it has changed the mood right, among the Taiwanese American community. And there is much more optimism. And I think there's much more willingness now to engage in a positive way to talk about what the future is going to be. Thanks, Don. We have room for one more question. Yeah, so, the lady over on the left here. Hi, my name is Claire from Human Rights Watch. And um, I'm, this is primarily for Mr. Lee. And I was just wondering if you could expand more on what is being done at the university level right now. You said that a lot of student groups were established following the movement. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know more about what you're planning, um, if there are any other big mov movements or protests that you know, will be happening in the near future, if you just talk more about that. OK. So for recently, when the Zhang Zhijun came to Taiwan, we want to stop him, because actually we know he will be a, a negotiation under the table. So. That's what we're against. So we follow up action during these days, and but we also find out that the the government still block us in a very not democracy way, not a rule of law way. So uh, that will, will be our focus on the, the be the focus we'll keep following on. But for the long term, for me, the democracy doubting, we believe that we have to do some the nonviolent action, direct action. To in certain scale, because that's what we think is a defense, a way to defend the de democracy of Taiwan. So we'll keep in doing that because we we believe that we can now win the government in material or 
much. We can. We don't have weapon. We don't have money like them. But we can conquer them by political way, which is which is means to gain the trust and to deepen to make people stand up in a peaceful way, just just like Alnia or India when then gain their independence. They going to do it this way. So we're trying to train our volunteer activists to be more professional on the action. Yeah, and also another way, because the, Taiwan, the democracy of Taiwan, okay, it's not, cannot just only be election. For Singapore has election, Hong Kong also have election, but which is not strength enough, not strong enough for a really democracy country. So we are trying to to do like the civil constitutional assembly to to make a democracy the meaning of democracy more uh, conquer to more conquer and more deep yeah maybe if i may add to that one point i think the whole rise of the civil society in taiwan really has reached a critical mass if i can say so but it spreads itself around to many different issues many different organizations Amnesty International is very active in yeah. Taiwan. There's a group that cares about the dolphins out in the yeah. ocean, yeah. you know. There's so many issues, but people are learning how to organize themselves. Social media is helping. So that is really a, a reinvention almost of civil society in Taiwan. So with that, I'd like to close this session and we make room for the next panel. So let's give a big hand to the three speakers. And I'd like to invite the next panel to come up.